Ксения Евгеньевна, подскажите, пожалуйста, Ксения Евгеньевна, could you please tell us about the quality and habit of not lying? Does it include holding back a part of information if you think that you shouldn't say it to a particular person in a specific situation? Does it include the notion of honesty and responsibility, if honesty is to speak up the truth no matter what? Honesty doesn't mean to speak up the truth no matter what. Honesty is not to lie when you need to give specific information. Holding back the information is not a factor of dishonor, just the opposite. There is a reason why Russian folks say, measure twice and cut once. Because sometimes a spoken truth can be evil. In what case can it be evil, if no one asked for it? Therefore, on several occasions, silence is always appropriate. If you're not asked for it, and if you don't want to give the information to a particular person, to lie is to give information that does not exist and does not correspond to reality. To hold back the information is to keep the veil closed. In what case is it necessary? Our ancestors formulated this rule and solved this question the following way. The one who wishes to know the truth must ask three times, must do that himself, and must do that voluntarily. It is forbidden to force the information upon someone unless asked. It is forbidden to give information if you understand that the person who's asking you for this information isn't really expecting it, doesn't want it, or is actually asking you for something else. But as a rule, the first two requirements, such as asking three times and not opening your mouth unless asked to do so, work perfectly well and never fail. To lie is to tell something that was never there. Lying is a wishful thinking. A lie is a distortion of information which should be accurately describing the reality, but instead distorts it. Accordingly, this distorted information, perceived as truth, becomes reality. It changes the course of time, it changes the course of history. The gods do not like it very much, and as a rule always return both, the flow of time and the course of history, back to the direction they should follow. And whoever allowed himself to lie will pay for this action with his energy and time. Because the process of levelling the informational currents is highly energy-intensive. Where can we get this energy from? Either from the liar or from his voluntary victim. That is someone who believed him and began to act according to this information believed him to such an extent to admit that it's true. People were deceived and some can ask, but what is their fault? They were lied to. But is this really so? How far can a person swear to have done everything possible to verify this information? How honest is he when saying that he had a reason to trust it? Maybe he is a liar too for continuing self-deception. Ethically, it is a very difficult question. How can you accuse an innocent of being a liar if the only thing he did was believing a liar? The ancient philosopher Sajiz used to say, yes, 
They are equally responsible because both the Liya and the one who believed him were given the same right to free will. For the one, whether to lie, and for another, to verify the information. Is it fair? This particular sentence requires reflection. Although not without reason, even in the Christian paradigm it is believed that the greatest sin is to betray those who trust you. But it does not say anything about those who trust being exempt from responsibility. They certainly will find themselves on a different level of hell, where the torment is not as terrible, but they will still go to hell. Therefore, they are not exempt from the need to be free in their own convictions and manifest their free will according to the principles of free will, instead of having to justify themselves simply because they did not have the courage to verify or refute the information. This will be my answer to you, dear colleague. Victoria asks, Xenia Evgenevna, at one of our meetings you said that now we should distance ourselves from the system and try not to depend on it as much as possible. However, there are people, just a few, who manage to be independent from the system and at the same time enjoy its benefits. My question is the following. Who are those people you talked about? Are they mages? Not just mages, dear colleague, but also ordinary people who realize, truly realize that freedom is the most precious thing in the world. It is possible to communicate with the system in different ways. There are people who are confident that the system owes them, simply confident of it. Again, this response comes from the answer to the previous question. We were told that we live in a democratic society, well, this is what they say, even wrote this down in a book, and called it the Constitution, there is something about democracy in there. And we believed it. Frankly speaking, only a few people have actually read the Constitution, just like they did with the Bible. Well, this is what they told us. But nevertheless, this concept has formed a certain complex of illusions within the consciousness. These people certainly rely on a much denser paradigm. Take the same Christianity, for example, the same Abrahamic religions. They also say, believe and it shall be. There is no need to confirm it, you just need to believe. There is no need to prove God's existence, just believe in it. And here as well, there is no need to read this type of literature. Simply believe what is said there. And they also told you that now you have the right. It's pretty convenient to believe in it, although it is impossible to confirm. Do we actually have the right? <coughs> An ordinary person begins to interact with the system based on this concept, this paradigm. Here I am living within this system, and it owes me. But does it? Yes, it does. This is what is written in the laws, in the constitution itself. And I am starting to take from this system, since it owes me. Of course, there is also a fine print that says what I owe, but it isn't right. This type of information is inconvenient, I can read it later, there are way too many letters there, but it is written there that you do owe, and at some point the system says, let's get even, and a person is confused, what is that about, no, it's not fair, that wasn't the deal, and the system says, what do you mean this wasn't the deal, of course it was, it is written right here, in the constitution, in the Bible. It says how you will have to pay back. A person falls into this trap only due to his own illiteracy and laziness. He is too lazy to dig deeper in order to obtain and learn the information. The system, of course, engulfs him into itself right away. Whether it provides a person with little or a lot, it allows him to enjoy the benefits of its own institutions, the one it has created. And then the worst happens, 
the system runs out of time, the timer is off. It says, listen up guys, there will no longer be any of my institutions, nor benefits I used to provide. What kind of institutions? Any kind. Medicine, education, financial services. You got accustomed to using all of them, it seemed natural to you. But now I am telling you, it won't happen again. You don't agree. Then it's easy, just follow me. We will transition to a different path, but you'll follow me as my property, because for you these institutions are more important than your own free will. So those who are not in the system, they understand all this and interact with the system by purchasing its benefits for an already declared fair price. I give you eight hours of my time, and you give me a certain amount of money as well as this and that. Is it fair? It is fair. I give you my money, you give me the goods. I give you my professional knowledge in this particular amount, and you give me back something else. It's a fair deal. But as a rule, people usually don't act this way. They go to work, they don't realize that they're selling their time, they're bringing their children to be baptized, they don't realize that they're enslaving their children to a Judaic God. They don't consider it because it's a tradition, and it's natural to them. Whether my child or I go to college for free, yet I don't want him to work for the government, I want him to go somewhere abroad and get settled. But instead, he is being drafted to war. I say it's not fair, but the system is telling you, no, darling, let's count. Kindergarten, school, medical school, university, or whatever else. Why isn't this fair? It is written in the Constitution. The system never breaks its own rules, but a person is just too lazy to study the system in which he lives. Those few who are free and have studied this neither expect or take anything from the system for free. When receiving benefits from the system, they immediately ask themselves, what will they have to do in return? Right now, you're offering me some kind of service. Pretty cheap, for free, or something like that. And please be clear what I have to do in return. No fine print. Write it right here, and we will read, we will check it out, and find out. That's what free men do, not just mages. Mages ultimately do not deal with the system, never, ever. They dive in and out of it because they have the right to do so. And the warriors establish their relationships with the system precisely based on the agreement. You can hate the system as much as you want, but you cannot comply with the rules of this agreement, otherwise it will eat you up. It will instantly hand you an enormous bill. And the system says, warrior, you are no longer a warrior, you are now a merchant because you have sold me your time for money, and the agreement states what I give you for your services, but in return, I don't take your professionalism, I don't take your knowledge, I take your time, eight hours as it was agreed upon. There is no need for professionalism or knowledge. You can surely give it to me, but this is exclusively voluntarily. I pay for your time, you are now a merchant. Or even lower, up to the level of a labourer, where nobody pays for your time. You pay with your life instead. If it is not your life, then it is the life of your children. Bring me your children, and I'll have them for dinner tonight. This is slavery. It's pure slavery. 
when either your life or the life of your children belong to neither one of you. Just because everything has been given away ahead of time, perhaps even before their birth, all your descendants have been already promised to someone else. But that's what the majority of the religious systems do. The government does not possess this type of rights. How to stay away from the system? Be aware. Any action, any offer from the system must immediately trigger a response within the consciousness. What is in return? You make it very clear for yourself, what do they actually want from me in return, and do I agree to that? Respect someone else's boundaries. When entering a foreign territory, a warrior knows that there is a master with his own rules. And if you do not follow these rules, any master has the right to destroy you, physically, socially, emotionally, psychologically, no matter how, simply to destroy. A warrior, a free man, must know perfectly well his own boundaries as well as the boundaries of others and try to never cross them. But if you happen to cross those boundaries, then do it with the purpose of taking over. Keep pursuing your goal while knowing that you are capturing a foreign environment. But warriors rarely act this way. Merchants do that because they have no other way. A warrior is not a hard-headed soldier. A warrior is a man of honor. And first of all, a man of honor respects not only his own notions of honor, but also the honor of others. That's probably, will be my answer to you, colleague.